here is to help sponsor programmatic initiatives that provides the UCLA community, staff, faculty, and students with an opportunity to interrogate deeply some pressing matter of equity, diversity, and inclusion, typically under the rubric of cross-check live. This is one such effort uh, to which I will turn in just a minute um, to give you a sense of some of the programmatic initiatives that we've organized under this rubric. Uh, we've done projects on sexual violence on campus, uh, police violence, freedom of speech, uh, processing the elections, to name a few. And indeed, next week, Tuesday, we're taking up the hard question of how one negotiates a relationship between the freedom of individuals to come on campus and speak and the freedom of students to organize against those speakers. How does one navigate that particular concern? I'm hoping to see you there uh, next week, Tuesday, as we try to explore uh, that particular opportunity. I don't have to hope to see you here today because you're already here, uh, presumably, to take on this terrifically important question, what's in a name? I think you all understand that naming practices across communities are terrifically, terrifically important. Think about contestations within the African-American community, from Negro to Afro-American to Black, African-American. Think about what's going on in uh, the Latino community. Latinx, Latina, Latino, Chicana. Think about Asian-American, Asian Pacific Islander, indigeneity, Indian. These are all a way of us to think about how we define ourselves in relationship to others and whether these naming practices uh, reflect our experiences in the world world and shape how we think of our possibilities as well. So how we name ourselves, it seems to me, uh, matters deeply. And it seemed to us critically important to put this naming practice question vis-a-vis -vis the LGBTQ uh, plus community into sharp relief. And that's precisely what this project means uh, to do. Um, I will not own uh, the substantive content of the conversation as it will unfold. Our wonderful campus partners, including the LGBT Center and the Williams Institute, um, primarily uh, determined how this conversation would unfold. And as you will see, it's a, a terrific program, one that has as its project the aim of lifting up students' experiences. Students are experiencing these questions of um, naming practices on the ground, as it were. Students are thinking about why it might be important to name themselves in particular ways on college campuses and off. So you'll see that students will figure prominently in the discussion and figure prominently, quite frankly, vis-a-vis -vis how this particular event was organized. So this is the moment in which I shut up and sit down and turn things uh, over to Andy. But I want to thank you all uh, again for coming. We really are looking forward to your questions, to your comments, and to your overall engagement, because we're sure uh, that it will enrich uh, the conversation uh, this evening. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, um, ABC Carbato, for that introduction. My name is Andy Gaffino. I'm going to lower this a little bit because I'm short. Um, I use the pronouns he, him, his, or they, them, theirs, and I'm the director of the UCLA LGBT Campus Resource Center. Um, we're a co-sponsor of this program tonight and really, really excited and really, really delighted to have such a rich and wonderful panel and a wonderful moderator um, to support this really important conversation. Um, before we begin, I want to just say a few thank yous. I definitely want to thank um, the Office of EDI and the Bruin X office specifically, um, including Devin Carvato, um, Aaron Kint's father, Rusty uh, Coloner, for your, all of the work that you all did to support this program, um, as well as the folks from the Williams Institute, in particular, um, Adam Romero, um, who's really uh, been a wonderful partner as we think about this event, and um, the panelists, and really did a lot of work to help us coordinate this event. I also want to thank um, the staff in, here in the library, in the Charles E. Young Research Library, who not only provided the space for us, um, but really supported us in many ways as we organized for this program. We needed support to actually host the program in this um, space. So I want to thank Diana King and Susie Lee for all of your support um, here in the library space. And of course, all of our wonderful panelists and our wonderful moderator. Um, so the way that the program is going to go is um, as soon as I sit down, um, after I read the, the bio of our wonderful um, co-moderator, Sohini, I will sit down and we'll kind of introduce you all a little bit to each panelist with their bios. And then there'll be a question or a prompt for each panelist to respond to for a few moments, um, after which then Sohini and I will raise a few other questions to the panelists and give them time to respond to that conversation. And then as time allows at the end, we hope to take questions um, from the audience. 
I'll also mention that there are all-inclusive gender inclusive restrooms right around the hallway if you make a right and then another right there's two over there but also remind you to please sign in the front if you have not done so already feel free to grab food throughout um, I'll also uh, mention, ask for folks who may be taking pictures or interested in ways that this can be recorded or shared, et cetera. We are actually video recording this program, uh, the front stage, not the back, um, but we are recording. And so I would ask of the audience members to not um, Facebook Live or do any live streaming of this event um, because we actually wanna make sure that the program um, you know, is posted on the website that we have and that we sort of know where, where the material is being shared basically. Um, so without further ado, I do want to introduce you um, to our wonderful, wonderful co-moderator, uh, Sohini Halder, who is from the class of 2021. Uh, she is a sophomore undergraduate student at UCLA as a pre-human biology and society major and music industry minor. Sohini has been involved with UCLA Healthcare Extenders, CTSI RAP Clinical Research Program, the LGBT Campus Resource Center Outreach Committee, LA Hackers, uh, Hacker Operations Committee, UCLA Choir, and sits on the executive board for the organization Bruin Blood Initiative. She's especially interested in the intersection of LGBTQ social justice and healthcare. So, Hini, will you begin us with us um, by reading the first bio? Of course. So, to introduce our first panelist, Ohini Ya Ampofo Anti, um, a, a Songke Health and Human Rights Fellow and candidate class of 2019. Ohini Ya Ampofo Anti is a 2018-2019 UCLA Sanke Health and Human Rights Fellow slated to earn his LLM from UCLA in 2019. He earned his LLB from University of Cape Town in 2013 and was admitted as an attorney in 2017. Prior to attending UCLA, Ampofo Anti worked as a trainee investigator at Public Protector South Africa. At PPSA, he assisted with ongoing investigations into maladministration in various government entities. His work covered issues related to administrative justice, immigration law, family law, refugee and asylum seeker law, and socioeconomic rights. And Pofo Anti has also written legal articles for Ground Up, an online, online news publication covering social justice issues for ground in the South Africa. And Pofo Anti's articles have been featured on numerous news websites and publications throughout South Africa. Please welcome Ohini Ya Ampofo Anti. Dr. Mitchell Morris is the Interim Director of LGBTQ Studies here at um, UCLA. He's also a professor of musicology. He taught at UCSD and McGill University before coming to UCLA in 1997. Among his many specialties are music, gender and sexuality, opera studies, music at the last fin de la cilie, I'm not sure if I said that correctly, um, Russian and Soviet music, American popular song, eco-musicology, film and TV music. He is a, a co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of the American Musical and the author of The Persistence of Sentiment, Display and Feeling and Popular Music in the 1970s. A frequent collaborator with the Los Angeles Opera is also an active working libre librettist with uh, premieres in the US and Mexico. He was one of the, the founders of LGBTQ studies in musicology and has received awards for his pioneering course in LGBTQ popular music taught at UCLA annually since 1998 and the source of many similar courses in other universities. His current project is a large scale historical account of LGBTQ popular music from 1880 to 1940. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris, for being with us today. Marine Sadat is a project coordinator at the Williams Institute. Previously, they were a research coordinator at the Los Angeles LGBT Center, where they worked on the first PrEP adherence study focused on transgender and gender nonconforming populations. They have several years of experience working with nonprofits and community-based organizations, including being a coordinator at the Trevor Project and an inter at, intern at the International Rescue Committee. They are interested in social determinants of health and health disparities in marginalized communities. Madin received a Bachelor of Science in Public Health from the University of California, Irvine. Thank you, Madin. We also have with us tonight Dr. Carlos Santos, Assistant Professor in the Department of Social Welfare. His research draws on diverse disciplines, theories, and methods to better understand how oppressions such as racism, heterosexism, etc., overlap to create unique conditions for individuals, conditions that are shaped by the context one occupies with implications for one's development and well-being. He's interested in how individuals cope with these overlapping stressors through attitudes associated with membership in different social groups, such as having pride in one's ethnic, racial, and or sexual identity group, and positions one occupies 
um, such as being undocumented, undocumented, and whether such coping uh, attenuate or amplify the negative consequences of overlapping oppressions on mental health, educational outcomes, and civic engagement. His research is concerned with questions such as how are racist and heterosexist events uniquely and jointly related to mental health among queer Latinx youth? Does having pride in being Latinx and or queer buffer or amplify these effects? Ultimately, the aim is to translate this research into practical intervention. Dr. Santos has authored nearly 30 peer-reviewed articles. His co-edited book with Adriana Umania Taylor, Studying Ethnic Identity, Methodological and Conceptual Approaches Across Disciplines, was published in 2015 by the American Psychological Association Press. He co-edited a peer-reviewed journal section on the appliances of intersectionality to the helping professions published in the Journal of Counseling Psychology, and he co-edited a special issue on the integration of an intersectionality lens in developmental science published in New Directions for Child and Adolescent Development. Along with colleagues, he has received funding from the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health. In 2017, he was awarded the Emerging Professional Contributions to Research Award by the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity, and Race of the American Psychological Association. He has received his PhD in Developmental Psychology from NYU, a master's degree in education from Harvard University, and a bachelor's degree from New York University. Thank you so much, Dr. Santos, for joining us. <laughs> And last, but certainly not least, we have Vanessa Wari. Vanessa Wari is a Nigerian-American researcher, strategist, and advocate committed to the liberation, empowerment, and safety of Black transgender women, queer and transgender people of color, and all communities existing at various intersections of oppression. For over 11 years, Vanessa has provided empowerment-based empowerment, I'm sorry, empowerment-based direct services and peer education for transgender communities, LGBTQ, QIA plus youth, and the incarcerated. Some highlights of her professional background include serving as a mayoral appointee on the San Francisco Youth Commission, co-founding the Transgender Advocates for Justice and Accountability Coalition in memory of a client and friend, Taja de Jesus, who was murdered in San Francisco, and working as a research associate for the UCSF Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. As a 2018 Point Foundation scholar, Vanessa attends UCLA, pursuing a double major in anthropology and sociology. Vanessa hopes to be able to support younger, queer, and transgender people of color in their educational attainments by creating initiatives that center their experiential ex expertise in research about them. In addition, Vanessa provides support to the UCLA LGBT Campus Resource Center as the assessment and engagement intern, where she is currently leading evaluation efforts to increase supportive services for queer and trans student, students of color through interdepartmental collaboration. Thank you, Vanessa. So to get the conversation started, what we're first going to do is ask each panelist to discuss language and the impacts on and within LGBTQIA plus communities in your academic research area and or your personal experience. So perhaps we'll start here and everybody can share a little bit. How long do you want us to speak? Okay. <laughs> Important to know. Um, so. I study social identity development, as you mentioned. I'm really interested in our relationship to group labels, to our membership in different race, ethnicities, ethnic groups, different sexual identity groups, and I'm interested in the variety of ways in which we relate to these, uh, to group membership. And so, one of the things I've been involved in, in part because I keep getting asked to to do this, and I keep trying to think of other queer, Latinx, developmental psychologists, and I just can't think of one. So I may be a loner, or I'm sure they're out there. I just can't think of anybody to refer, because I keep getting requests from orgs who are interested in uh, psychological um, organizations, national associations that are currently looking at transitioning towards the use of Latinx. So that's come up quite a bit, and I ended up writing a piece around it in part because they kept getting asked to do it. Uh, and, you know, I have to publish and do other things. And this was sort of like, you know, coming up over and over. So, um, so that's been a, a, a strong uh, sort of advocacy aspect of the work I do, because it's, you know, I wouldn't necessarily consider this piece I wrote that's published in a journal, but I wouldn't call it sort of my, it's, you know, it's not a typical research paper that I would write. Um, but it really is exploring various assertions concerning racial ethnic um, 
particularly racial, ethnic, and uh, group affiliation, group identities. Um, and Latinx sort of um, is the focus. And so I kind of trace the history of the use of acts um, in this piece. I talk about that a little bit. You know, I, I don't I don't think I'd go into Malcolm X, but there's a whole sort of, um, you know, there are various uh, sources one could think of as uh, the sort of revolutionary or resistance uh, sort of aspect of using acts um, as a signifier for uh, for various things. Um, and so that's sort of, I think, you know, where I, I'm, I'd love to talk to you more about that. It comes up a lot. I get asked to, uh, to be the token, uh, queer Latino in, a lot of, in, in all these orgs. And so I'm constantly having to get, I'm constantly dealing with hate mail and people who are upset and, you know, in my field who feel threatened. Um, but in that process, I've actually had some really interesting conversations. Like I've, you know, one that really stuck with me, I talk about it in this piece, is a senior colleague who is, uh, identifies as Latina, um, someone I respect, whose work I cite. And, um, you know, and there was a sense of loss, I think, and that was her struggle with Latinx. It was a sense of like, now I have to give up the Latina label that I worked so hard, you know, that i am so heavily underrepresented in my field. I've made it to full professor. And now, you know, you're telling me I have to come up with a new label. And, and I think in that process, I really reflected on how, you know, the, the use of Latinx as a group uh, signifier does not preclude anybody from choosing what I like. It's sort of an, the antithesis of what we're ultimately, but it is something that I've had to grapple with in these various contexts. So I, I'd love to talk more about that. And um, thank you for having me. Um, I guess I'll start more personal. I think just it's, it's interesting as a community how you know, some folks, at least trans folks, will speak to my own experience. It's really not having words. So then when you do have words and you do have terminology, it's kind of like, oh, okay, this is a thing. Um, so I think that's really powerful just in general when we're having this conversation, I think to think of like the power of words and how words have evolved in this community, um, especially how a lot of it has evolved online, I think is really interesting and how people are sort of carving out spaces for themselves um, where previously they didn't feel like they were seen or they feel like they didn't fit in those spaces. So I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, Research-wise, we have a lot of these conversations at Williams when we're developing surveys. Um, so when we're thinking about asking the question, what's your current gender identity? You know, what does that look like? You know, I'm sure you've seen surveys where there's like literally every gender may be listed that you can look up. And then there are surveys that are a little bit, you know, are you trans, that kind of thing. And there's just like trans, non-binary, you know, man, woman, trans woman, trans male, that kind of thing. Um, so we think a lot about that and how to be thoughtful, as thoughtful as we can with that. But also, I guess also understanding why we're asking those questions, like why, you know, if we're asking people to say like what their gender is, are we actually reporting it that way? Or are we sticking everybody like holistically in a group? Are we calling everyone who marks other queer, you know, when we publish the paper? So it's kind of like that process is something that we think about um, and I think that we're very aware of. Um, so that's a good thing. I'm not sure I have anything to add besides that. Hi, everybody. Um, so I wanted to touch on something again, um, speaking from my own perspective. And that's something which is why Andy actually asked me to come here, which is the tensions in the, commu the bisexual community and those who identify with non-monosexual sexual identities. So all these proliferation of terms like heteroflexible, homoflexible, homoromantic, queer, fluid, um, bisexual, pansexual, and I wanted to touch specifically on how, what language means and what its implications are, and just from my own perspective, what, how I think we should navigate this conflict. So, for example, there's been an emerging debate around um, people saying that bisexual um, reifies the gender binary in a sense that it refers to only an attraction to men or women whereas pansexual is used as a term to mean having the capacity to love beyond gender. Now, this seems to be doing the rounds on social media, celebrities as well, 
sort of eschewing the fact that first they said they were bi and now they use pansexual rather as a term. And both personally and from friends that I know within the bi community, this is actually much more complex than it appears. A lot of people who I know who identify with the term um, bisexual actually use bisexual, pansexual, and queer somewhat interchangeably. And the use of those terms is based more on things like who they're speaking to, how accessible is that language, um, who understands what that term means in that context, and what form they're filling out. So it shows that this language is kind of fluid. And so I just wanted to make two observations around how from a policy perspective, researchers, academics, lawyers should navigate these kind of tensions with language and the elasticity of language. So um, Jeffrey Weeks, a prominent sociologist, talks about uh, identities as necessary fictions. And he basically argues that these identities, categories, and labels we use are not necessarily accurate descriptions of a person's lived experience, but we use them more as monikers to establish solidarity. And so he speaks to the political or strategic use of labels or categories. And similarly, as my colleague is mentioning with race and the emergence of Latinx, when you think in South Africa, um, black was a term which was used by the apartheid government to demonize, to dehumanize. But then you have thinkers like Steve Biko, who talked about black consciousness and pride in one's African or black identity. So to me, I think that um, part of dealing with this tension is around looking at what strategic or political consequences follow from using one term to the next. And then last, if I have time, <laughs> um, I want to touch on intragroup differences. So even within the term bisexual, that means a lot of different things, depending on one's gender identity, one's race, one's geography. It's contingent on so many different things. And when we use terms like bisexual, queer, or trans, these are not monolithic terms that speak to a universal experience. And so I wanted to speak a, a bit about um, my professor, Professor Crenshaw, who teaches here, as I'm sure many of you know her, about intersectionality and um, Ezra Young, who's a civil rights attorney, he argues in the context of the word trans that we could use intersectionality as a framework to both understand how cohesive a particular group or identity is, whilst also navigating the subgroups or individual dimensions. And so he, has, he's, he argues that using an intersectional lens can help us understand both how broad and narrow language is and the use of a particular word or moniker. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so for me, when I think about uh, language and the impacts that it has on LGBTQ community, um, I obviously come from a background of providing uh, advocacy and supportive services for the communities that I belong to. Um, that is, you know, what I am passionate about. And so for me, in thinking about language, um, you know, I'm really thinking about uh, a community's ability um, to have words to connect to, specifically talking about my experience um, belonging to the trans community, um, having words um, that are imbued with meaning um, that are specific to us, that enable us to connect to something, um, thinking about the ability uh, or the power that language has to, you know, craft realities. And when we you know, in, in terms of trans identity, like queer and non-binary identity and, and sort of the evolution of the language that we've had um, regarding these over time, um, thinking about whose narrative gets to be centered when we have these discussions um, and whose voices we're uplifting when we're crafting this knowledge. Because um, when I think language, I really think about knowledge production and having that information that future generations get to draw upon um, when they seek to find words or resources to identify with and to understand themselves and be understood by others as well. Um, and, you know, so, so again, for me, when I think about the impact of 
language on the community, um, I think whose language uh, is my first question. Um, is it language that is being crafted, uplifted, and centered by the community? Is it is is it in the community's own words, um, or you know how many different channels is it being filtered through before it, it is? Um, considered to be an authority or a language or, or knowledge with a capital N. Um, you know, and so again, coming from a perspective of, of, you know, being centered within my community and really wanting to amplify and, and, and increase the voice of my community and the work that I do, you know, I've seen countless times having to justify myself or, you know, seeing my colleagues or my community have to justify themselves in their experiences um, and their, you know, their background. Uh, to somebody who, you know, has read or theorized or, you know, discussed, you know, my actual lived experience, what I live every single day, um, and having to, to legitimize that in some ways to people who, who have never really truly um, experienced my life as I live it on a day-to-day -day basis. And so for me, language is really important in that, you know, who it comes from makes all the difference in the world when we're talking about the future definitions, the future language that we'll have for future generations who get to draw from that. And I'm, I love talking about that. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I am clearly somewhat of an outlier in two extremely useful ways today. First of all, disciplinarily, I come from a very different place than the, my other panelists. I'm from the humanities and the arts. And we have slightly different ways of doing things that I hope will be actually useful that I'll talk about in a moment. But second is the personal history. I am the representative old person here. Um, I think that really matters because some aspects of my experience are really directly relevant to all of this. Um, the first of these is coming to terms with sexuality as a teenager in extreme rural Bible Belt, North Carolina in the mid 70s. Um, that's a very different place where, in fact, you don't want language because language will expose you and the most important thing you can do in that world is hide. What happens after that is that you need a code. When I was an undergraduate, I was at Duke University in the early 80s. We were not out. No one was out. We had special terms that we needed to identify whether someone was, well, as the old term used to be, family or not, because this is a world that's not safe. So my response to this was to look for language, to look for things to know. But in Eastern North Carolina in this period, what's available is likely to be a hideously homophobic sociological treatise from about the early 1950s that will do nothing but convince you that you should die instantly. Having recovered from that, I got very interested in the history of language and the history of these concepts. And my own work, which tends to be very historically based, caused me to pay a huge amount of attention to the history of terminology. Terminology is particularly interesting because when you look from the coinage of the, the word homosexual in, um, what year was it, 1869, to the other kinds of terms that communities have developed, terms that have a lot to do with what their position is, how out they can be, how much they need to justify themselves, how much they need to find ways of making common cause, you discover that, well, I like to actually say there's no such thing as homosexuality. There's at least six or seven different kinds I can think of off the top of my head, each one which probably has multiple names because of multiple countries, of uh, social levels, geographical spaces, all of these things play into how people use their languages. Now, I took these interests with me into my own field, which is also significant because, technically speaking, the academic studies that we recognize now as LGBTQ, et cetera, studies develop in 1970. That's when the first courses are actually offered in odd places like the University of Nebraska, and at Kent State. They do not get offered at Harvard. They do not get offered at UCLA. They get offered in small places with a few people who have the nerve to do this. And the development of these fields in different disciplines takes place at different rates. In my own field, 
one particular professor wrote an article in 1976. There was nothing out after that until he was asked to organize a panel at a scholarly society in 1985. It was a panel that was so depressing with the universal experience of people standing up to say, well, music doesn't work like that. Music doesn't work like that. You can't talk about that. That's not really real. Is it a thing? Is it a phase, et cetera, that he gave up and started having parties for, uh, for family at the conferences. But by 1989, there was time for a session. By 1990, there was time for an organization, a study group. At that point, it was called the Lesbian and Gay Study Group. There was a fight five years later about bisexuals that finally ended with, yes, we should include this too. And again, it's all about how you feel you are as a community and how much you can risk extending the boundaries of this community. That's an important thing for people who are afraid for people who don't know if they have the luxury of coming out. Not everyone can come out at every time. Um, to this day, there will be people in Alabama who hate the word queer because queer means someone's about to kill you. And when we use that term uncritically and uncarefully, we've simply deleted them from actual participation in our world. So my experience of the development of that in my own field has caused me to be acutely attentive to the different kinds of languages that exist and also kind of willing to say maybe we should revive some old terms once in a while. Maybe it will feel right to someone to say, oh, well, I'm a bulldagger or to someone else to say, well, hey, pansies over here. Um, I sometimes like to describe myself as, an old, as a loquacious old queen because it gets at something important to me that I can't get to otherwise. And it's that kind of incredible diversity of terms and positions that I'm particularly interested in in this conversation. We are a multiplicious people, and we ought by right to enjoy our multiplicious terms. And that's where I'll stop for now. Thank you all so much for sharing. That was incredible. I kind of heard a shared theme of language as performance, kind of it matters who's saying something, but it also matters who's hearing it, right? And so language is kind of morphing as the audience changes and the speaker changes. And so I guess we'll go into our questions. Uh, to start off, um, can each of you uh, talk a little bit about what is the particular significance of queer and trans specific language? How has it changed and evolved over time and why? Well, I just had my innings on that topic, so I'm going to pass the mic. Can you read the question one more time? Sure. What is the particular significance of queer and trans-specific language? How has it changed and evolved over time, and why? Well, um, you know, first uh, off the bat, the significance of queer and trans language um, is, th is that it needs to exist. Um, it, it is something, again, uh, from my perspective, uh, the significance is that it, it allows future generations to have, um, you know, something to connect to, to be able to express themselves, describe themselves, relate to, uh, et cetera. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's evolved in many ways because, you know, we, uh, as trans people, myself as a trans person, have always understood um, myself through my community and the community has always had ways to describe and express themselves to each other and that is something that has always existed um, you know um, we we can tend to think of things as new um, in the way that they sort of emerge into the discourse um, but but we know that these things have always existed um, and and you know I think that the way that that continues to evolve, again, as, as my colleague just said, you know, to where we allow, you know, not for a stricter border, but for a more elastic border to extend and be more encompassing um, of these many different identities and really, really just more ways to describe what already has been. You know, I don't think that new people come along with these new definitions. We've always been here and we're just sort of working with the existing structures that language has given us in order to, you know, define within our communities what that sounds like. Um, and yeah. I think to me, first and foremost, um, language in the, within the queer community is about finding community. So I think um, personally being able to find a word that I feel describes my experience allows me to find others 
like me, allows me to find role models, allows me to find people who I can look up to, people I can build community with, people I can share experiences with. So language is about finding community to me. But I also feel that there's a strong sense in which um, language gets repurposed over time. So there's something that Professor Mitchell's speaking to about how the word queer is still stigmatized in some parts. And um, I think that's interesting to me because I think I also mentioned this to Andy that in South Africa, um, we have a lot of derogatory terms which are used within the local languages for the word homosexual or someone who's not straight or not within the gender binary. And I think it's those terms that um, people would be more hesitant to use to describe to describe themselves because they're words which are equivalent to the N-word in the sense of being highly derogatory or pejorative terms. But on, on the other hand, I think it is also interesting when people take a word which previously was stigmatized and repurpose it. So um, I don't know how many of you watch Trevor Noah's Daily Show, but <laughs> I'm quite a fan. So he recently had Jacob Tobia, who's written a book called Sissy, A Coming of Gender Story. And I haven't read it, their book, but I just know that what they said to Trevor Noah was the reason why they used the word sissy is because um, at a very young age, sissy was the only word that seemed accessible to their experience. They didn't understand, you know, words like gender non-conforming, you know, at like the age of five. But this word to them seemed to say something about how um, the gender expectations which were placed on them were not in line with what, you know, who they were. And they felt that this term spoke to their experience. Um, and so I think when we're looking at the shift in language, I think I want to bring up what Vanessa said about who is it that's deciding that we're using this term? You know, is it rooted in marginalized folks, marginalized communities? Is it intersectional? Is it getting folks of color involved um, and different groups and stakeholders involved in what words and what language we're using? Or is it language which is being used um, and taking a top-down approach as opposed to a bottom-up approach? So I think I'm a firm believer in Vanessa of wanting to advocate for a bottom-up approach. And I think that could help us a lot in trying to find the tension between the old words and the new words. Um. I don't know that there's that much I want to add besides the idea of as language has evolved and we're getting new words, um, we're also, you know, getting corrected and getting policed, like within the community also. There's this idea of, you know, for example, the by pan, the idea of like, you know, this is the word, this is not the word. I hear a lot of that. Um, I hear a lot of... Um, just a lot of, you know, especially online, the discourse of like, well, if we say pansexual, for example, is that, you know, it's like you're attracted to all genders. Can you be attracted to all genders? Just things like this that people say a lot in the community. Um, and so there's a lot of correcting of each other that I think is very interesting. Um, and I think that there are certain terms that we, I think, understand as a community are reserved for certain groups of people. And then there's also words that are constantly changing, like everyone said before, um, and are being reused. And I think it's also generational as well, you know, just being aware of like what you're saying around certain people. Um, certainly older folks in our community, um, you know, a lot of folks don't like the word queer because of how it was used in the past. So just being um, aware of that. Thank you. So I, um, I'm thinking about the, the evolution of terms, and I'm thinking about it in a couple different ways. So I think we could think about it in terms of the history of terms, and we can think about individuals navigating in and out and, and how their own relationship to these labels might evolve over time. And in particular, I, th I thought of that. Um, Mitchell's point about being raised in the South uh, reminded me of my experience being, I was born and raised in Brazil. I immigrated when I was 15 by myself. 
Um, and, you know, I, part of that decision was that I was in a really oppressive context. I felt like there wasn't a space for me to find uh, myself. Um, I'm sure I would have managed, but, you know, I had the opportunity. So um, I ended up here. Um, and, you know, so I think of my, my own sort of trajectory and how my relationship to these labels has evolved, right, over time. So I think we can think of it that way. I think we can also, you know, historically you can think of things. So in my writings on Latinx, I've talked about how X has been used in Spanish-speaking countries. So one of the biggest misconceptions, I started with all the myths and misconceptions, that's all my subheadings in that piece. Uh, one of them is that it's some bizarre term that queer academics in the U.S. have come up with. Um, and, you know, so I trace Google Trends history, searches of Latinx. I talk about how X has used as a signifier for gender nonconforming or trans folks in various uh, contexts. In Argentina, I cite texts from almost two decades ago in Spain through um, the, um, uh, what are they called? The zines, they're like magazine, the, they're like, you know, forget what feminist group in Spain had been using it. Um, so, you know, I sort of, uh, so you could do it that way. You could think of it that way. In terms of why it matters, I, I think, you know, it matters at the individual level in terms of personal liberation, right? In terms of, um, you know, liberating yourself from oppressive forces, finding your, you, yourself and finding, uh, feeling comfortable in, in who you are. Um, but it also, I think, has social and political implications, which is something that we had mentioned earlier. So I think, you know, at organizational level, I mean, the reason why, and luckily it worked out. So now the National Latino, previously Latino, Latina Psychological Association, through the process I was involved in, is now called National Latinx Association. Uh, and their journal is called the Journal of Latinx Psychology. Those are huge, major changes for a national organization. Um, and the, dry, the sort of discussions we had was really about the social and political implications of the organization, standing in solidarity with it, right? So the organization was primarily run by cis, hetero folks. Um, and so I think that I think of it, you know, it matters both in terms of liberation and it matters because it has social and political consequences and how we use it in what context, those things matter and they have consequences. Thank you all so much. A lot of a lot has been shared about how um, both in, in uh, within the community, there's been a lot of sort of discussion around evolution of language, but also the impacts of folks outside of the community has had an impact on language, um, which kind of ties into and some folks have kind of responded to this a little bit, but we'd love to hear a little bit more. How does culture, generation, age, race, ethnicity and history play a role in the ways in which we conceptualize, shape, and define our gender and agender identities and sexualities and asexualities. So how does culture, generation, age, race, ethnicity, and history play a role in the way that we conceptualize, shape, and define uh, our gender identities, agender identities, sexualities, and asexualities? So similar, but um, a little bit more in depth, I guess, on some of those points. I mean, I suppose I can quickly, since um, I was just talking about related things. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, so a couple of things, I'm really glad you mentioned intersectionality it comes up a lot and it's a framework that I um, use in my work. Um, but, you know, often I think there, there, I think we need to make some distinctions when we apply intersectionality to this discussion. Um, I think intersectionality in terms of its writings that precede you know, Crenshaw, you can go back to Sojourner Truth, you can go back to Combahee River Collective in the 70s, which were primarily made up of queer black women, um, writing about what eventually became, um, you know, part of the national dialogue around intersectionality. To me, it, you know, often we talk of intersectionality when we're talking about intersecting identities, and I actually see a distinction between those two things. I think of intersectionality as really about overlapping oppression, overlapping stressors that individuals might experience. I think that's really core to these uh, early articulations of it and the sort of aspects that I think Crenshaw, in, you know, in part, and others, um, you know, uh, have Patricia Hill Collins, et cetera, have built upon. Um, but I think we sometimes do a disservice when we sum it up intersectionality as being about like, you know, being black and gay or let's I mean, it's, you know, we sort of, we're speaking of the social identity, but we're missing, leaving out the oppressive force that is at the center of this, uh, 
uh, theoretical and, and, and a framework and, and activist framework. Um, so I just want to bring attention to that, I think, as we engage in the discussion of these various social identities and how they might intersect and matter. Uh, yeah, I definitely so happy. I feel like I want to quote that in my class with Professor Grinshaw tomorrow. <laughs> Um, I think um, I actually recently read a book called Recognize the Voices of Bisexual Men, and it's a collection of books, a collection of, of uh, short stories, narratives, etc., written by and for by men within the broad understanding of that term from all around the world. And one thing which I found which was so interesting was how for each person, they brought what that term meant in such different ways. So for a lot of men of color, some of them spoke to something which I identified with, which was growing up in a lot of predominantly white spaces at school and later in college, and how the term bisexual kind of like, in a way, made them feel even weirder because to other people of color, they were seen as the coconut or the person who's trying to be white. And then on top of this, they had this term that isolated them from the queer community. And so in a sense, they, they experience a specific type of vulnerability or marginalization, being at the intersection of being um, not black enough, not gay enough. And that what that does to a person is very interesting. And then on the other hand is um, those who conflate the idea of being polyamorous with bisexual. So there's a trope around um, bisexuals are never faithful. They're always, you know, looking for the other gender when they're with one and all those tropes. But at the same time, there were some people who did write there that to them, um, they couldn't feel that they felt like they needed to experience different genders simultaneously to that's what their bisexuality meant to them. And in fact, um, I shared with Andy once that I had a friend who said that um, for him, bisexuality means if he's with one gender, then he feels that some part of him is missing all the time. So, and then on the other hand, there were those who um, came from the two-spirit experience where um, they also explained how bisexual kind of didn't necessarily fit within that framework of gender identity, but how they felt that they could identify with both of those terms. So it's kind of interesting how um, even within a particular group or category, as they intersect with these different types of identities, they create different experiences. But I think um, as my colleague Carlos is saying, I think it's important to note that intersectionality is about um, the way that those different identities result in different vulnerabilities that people are subject to. And I think when we're looking at language and trying to capture, um, especially from a policy perspective, how to assist people, we need to think about what kind of vulnerabilities that they're subject to. Um, so just to briefly add on, um, when, when, I, when I heard this question about how culture and generation and age and ethnicity play a role um, in how we like shape this language and shape these identities. Um, connecting personally uh, as a, a black trans woman who grew up in a household that didn't really uh, give me a lot uh, in terms of resources to be able to understand and identify with. Um, I was drawn to you know, my community of older black trans women um, who, through their own experiences and word of mouth, um, you know, I was sort of socialized and I inherited um, my stories. I inherited, um, you know, all of the different narratives and all of the, the, the ways that Black trans women have sort of walked in this world. Um, and, you know, the languages that were created um, the culture that was built around it. Um, and it became something that was inherited. And I think that it definitely became a part of who I was. And, and you know, I think that, you know, I get to see that play out um, a lot with my community and the way that they, you know, while we are in this process of creating new language, while we are in this process 
um, you know, of defining, um, you know, it, it was it was really important for for you know as a trans youth to have elders, um, you know, who even before we had this language, we're, we're, we're getting it through word of mouth through their elders as well. And so this is actually something like deeply ancestral in the way that like knowledge had, had been passed along through word of mouth generation by generation. Um, and that certainly was the experience that I had with relation to language and, and identity. And so I think that, you know, given that like language evolves over time and it's constantly changing what, what, I am seeing um, in my experience is that, you know, it's bringing together um, sort of full circle in this way, bringing together um, the like ancestral truths of my trans elders before me um, and sort of the marrying of like, well, all of the spaces that we are now creating to, to bring those back into the discussion, um, you know, and, and to legitimize them in a way that other generations get to use them. I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction <clears throat> by talking historically about something that's a problem right now. <clears throat> I notice it particularly you know, when I'm teaching. I'm extremely fond of teaching things that are pre-Stonewall. We'll use Stonewall as a convenient dividing point. Um, what matters is that that older culture, a culture where no one could be out without going to jail, where there was really no space for you in a public world, that culture is the one that we tend to sum up by thinking of which femme practices among lesbians, or we think of camp among gay men. And it turns out at this point in history to be exceedingly hard to teach because it has practices and assumptions that sit very uncomfortably with us right now for a number of reasons. One reason is the rise of, um, of a particular style of feminism of the 70s that really strongly rejected butch femme and all of its practitioners as completely unacceptable. Um, among men, the great problem is, of course, everybody died in the 80s. I mean, everybody almost died in the 80s. And that meant that a giant source of cultural transmission simply vanished, wiped off the face of the earth with nothing but the laughter of Republican administrations to accompany them. <laughs> the problem that that presents is that the practices that were integral to those communities are hard for many people to understand now. The most convenient way to look at it might be to think if you've ever seen the film Paris is Burning, which represents this older world in a lot of ways. Now, these are communities which are perfectly happy to use the most hideous derogatory stereotypes imaginable for humor. So you can see things that would make most of you extremely uncomfortable. And it's hard to process what they mean to us now. How do you deal with someone who is willing to go in some kind of garb that right now everybody would be furious with indignation? What does it mean in a world like that? Where in fact, part of the identification is, oh, well, I'm despised too. So I can just sort of translate into other categories that are condemned. That becomes really hard for us when the stakes are very different from us. for us. We are much more invested in how we can actually participate in a larger community. We're not closed in this way. And that to me is a wonderful example of how all these things define a particular set of practices around gender and sexuality that may not ultimately translate all that well that present us with problems of discontinuities and blockages that we can only understand by saying, well, this is not me ever, but I'm going to have to find a way of inhabiting that space as sympathetically as I can. And that becomes a real challenge. It becomes a real challenge all the more because all kinds of other terrible effects go into it. People are not always positive about themselves. There's a plenty a huge dose of self-hatred in a lot of people in this world. And that gets exercised as well through terminology. Ambivalence, hostility, um, depression, all of these things figure in just as surely as any kind of agency or, you know, sort of sense of, of self or any positive effects. And it's important that we keep that in mind. We must always deal with sort of the negative side of these things as well and find ways to cope with it, if only to sort of heal our history and heal ourselves. Thank you. Um, Medine, did you want to say anything? Um, Respond to that? I, can just add. I think it's really interesting when you were talking about having sort of, you know, elders to, to look up to and get that language from. 
um, I guess in my head it popped up sort of like the reverse. Like when we're thinking about um, folks who identify as non-binary or genderqueer and just not having that language before, um, though folks have always been around, just not having those words. Um, and then, you know, maybe bringing in like cis heteronormativity and how, you know, trying to carve out spaces within that um, and how we have words like gender flux and gender fluid and all of these things that, you know, maybe definitely have always been around, but just didn't have a word before. So I think it was just the flip side of what you said that, that also exists. Great. Thank you. I uh, quickly wanted to share just my experience as someone with Asian identity, South Asian Indian identity, um, and just grappling with language as a tool that's been used to uphold oppressive institutions and at the same time give visibility to marginalized groups. Um, and so um, just speaking specifically to the Indian community, when you have the language to kind of counteract these cis heteronormative um, institutions of like marriage, like caste systems, just everything else within that culture, you, you threaten not only this binary of sexuality or gender, but also marriage as an economic institution, right? Um, just, just all these broader frameworks that kind of have a ripple effect. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of speak to that as a per person of Asian descent. So, yeah. Um, we can move on to the next question. Um, in what ways do LGBTQIA plus communities struggle to name themselves and also identify strongly with particular words to situate their identities? such as gender and agender identities and sexualities and asexualities. Do you want me to repeat it? Yeah, sure. In what ways do LGBTQIA plus communities struggle to name themselves and also identify strongly with particular words to situate their identities? back in the day, one of the concerns that we had was what exactly the word gay was going to mean. Because it was really clear that not everybody who might be in our bars and might be in our beds was actually gay. Um, the kind of nonce categorization that many people came up with, well, if you're gay, that means you're actually political. If you're really closeted and have nothing to do with it, you must be still, still be a homosexual. And that kind of thing really sort of mattered at the time. That, in fact, the word gay, which probably seems anodyne and ordinary and completely unremarkable now, at one point was actually politically quite charged, in fact. So possibly your, you know, your ancestors from the 60s and 70s would still be attached to that because it actually meant a thing to be able to say, I'm gay. Well, that's the first time you have a word that isn't completely abject. It's really great to be able to say, well, I'm gay instead of I'm a cocksucker. I mean, come on, you know? It really is a space that's really quite wonderful. And then when you learn the history of it, you find out that, of course, we got it from the hookers. Uh, gay was originally a term that was in the world of prostitution. And it was borrowed by gay men because, well, you know, we were all in the same prisons. We were all in the same communities. And those kinds of things, I think we could trace many different histories. You probably know quite a few of them from, from um, the people who were your mentors. Um, those little histories are the things that we must always be attentive to. In a way, just paying attention is one of the crucial ways to get into these little questions because they're so different in so many different cases. Each particular community is going to have an interestingly different little context that means that it works in a slightly different way. And that kind of variety sort of put together is what gives us a better sense of the kinds of possibilities that are out there. I mean, maybe you want to speak to some of that because I know that they must have given you lots of stories. Hmm. Um, yeah, so when, when I think, um, I mean, yeah, this question really did just sort of pull me um, towards like the, the way that our histories have been um, written or told or have existed. I, I think that um, you for starters, we struggle. We struggle um, because you know we we struggle. We we the the fight has sort of never really stopped, um, and so it's sort of fighting on two fronts. This this fight just to be seen as human, um, and and then coupled with this fight to explain to ourselves and others who what we are. 
um, and, and more. Um, so, you know, it, it definitely is one of the reasons why we struggle. And then also just looking at the fact that we have not had the language to talk about, you know, who we are. That, that is always going to be one of the biggest things that jumps out. We are literally in a process of creation when it comes to language. What is going to work for us? And a lot of times, you know, as my colleague previously had said, um, you know, in the case of like non-binary identities and, and not having that as, reg- as like opposed to my experience of being imparted my histories as a, as a Black trans woman um, or as a trans woman, um, you know, people of, of, of non-binary identity, gender identity, asexualities, um, they really are taking the lead in crafting this knowledge um, for future generations. And they and themselves are taking, you know, roles as the future elders who will have provided this for the next generations. Um, you know, but but it, it can be a struggle to 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 sort of be fighting um, just just for your right to be seen as a human being, and you know, for human decency and access to full participation participation in society, um, and then to turn around and simultaneously be trying to you know legitimize your existence to you know people who may or may not want, you know, to see w- what it is that you're trying to get them to see or, or just, you know, struggle to understand that. Um, and so just naming that. I don't know if I can add anything. That was really great. Um, I guess it is really about, about being seen and, and participating in all of these things. Um, and also the, I guess the idea of people, I guess, struggling to name certain things. And that's where you get like nuances in words as well. Like when we were talking about how, you know, there are people, for example, um, who are non-binary who identify as trans, but that's not always the case. So we get like these and it's, we talked about earlier how it really varies on the person. And so while we struggle to situate ourselves like within the community, we don't always fit with the definitions that, you know, we might think of at first. So that's the only thing I would add to that. It's, it's, I don't know if it's like an in-community struggle, but it's just sort of like we need to have more of a mindfulness that words don't always mean the same things, even though they are the same words. Um, and then still trying to solidify like the idea of what we want this community to be um, as we present that to people who are not a part of our community um, and keep that solid even though we're very different maybe in the language that we use. Um, so um, there are a few things I'm, I keep thinking about um, as we have this discussion. One of them um, concerns the whitewashing of, uh, of certain oppressive forces within the community that we see. Um, you know, a clear case is the Stonewall movie that came out, which I, I'm sure, I hope nobody saw <laughs> because it was so deeply troubling, right? They had two uh, white characters uh, instead of, uh, you know, queer uh, trans women of color who were really, um, uh, you know, at the center of that movement. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think that's important to keep in mind. Uh, your point also made me think, uh, Sahini, um, about uh, Puar's work on homo nationalism and this idea. I actually looked it up because I want to make sure I get it right. So, the term was originally proposed by a researcher in gender studies, Jasper Puar, to refer to processes by which some powers line up with the claims of the LGBTI community in order to justify racist and xenophobic positions, especially against Islam. And, you know, it really, this, this notion, this sort of thinking about the consequences across borders, right, of, uh, of certain movements, of how we frame things, um, I think is, is often not uh, dissected enough in the U.S. context, um, and so I appreciate that point very much. Um, and it, you know, made me think of it. The other, your point about 
you know, uh, your, you know, one's relationship to these labels and fitting in, not fitting, you know, and sort of feeling like you never quite fit in. You mentioned being in predominantly white spaces and, you know, made me think of the contributions to intersectionality, which are often not um, mentioned from Chicana feminists who really brought attention to this idea of never, right, so sort of straddling borders, right, and feeling like you're never quite fit in on this side of the border and feeling like you never quite fit in. So, you know, they really brought attention to the psychological borders, right, that we experience. Um, and so, you know, I, I just wanted to throw that out there because I think these are concepts that, um, you know, really resonate with me in these discussions because we have a relatively, um, you know, the, uh, it's not, not often discussed or brought up in the U.S. context. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of questions. I have more questions <laughs> than things I want to contribute, but something I've been thinking about a lot, um, especially as I got more exposed to the fact that actually in a lot of indigenous cultures around the world, they already have expressions that connote things which exist with outside of the gender binary or even outside of traditional heteronormative understandings of sexuality. But I think one thing which I've been thinking about from a legal point of view, which is tricky, is how um, LGBTQ advocates trying to find solidarity around the world. To what extent is there, and this is more of a question to my fellow speakers and maybe even the audience if people have something they want to say about it, to what extent is there a danger when we try and develop, use terminology which predominantly developed within a Western context, academic places such as UCLA, and then use those terms to describe the experience of, say, people living in Papua New Guinea or in East Africa. Um, and to what extent is there a danger that importing terms which are trending on social media or amongst the millennial generation, when we try to use that language to then describe the experiences of people who actually have lived that experience for centuries, but often because of colonial um, influences, those types of identities have been, become stigmatized. So in a lot of African countries and a lot of countries which were colonized by uh, Western forces, they have anti-sodomy, anti-homosexuality laws, and a lot of Christian uh, missionary efforts yes. <laughs> yeah, um, kind of created, uh, reinforced notions of gender and sexuality that we have in a lot of the formerly colonized world. And, but at the same time, is there a danger now in that now that um, LGBTQ rights is becoming more acceptable, especially in the West, is there a danger in them then um, through almost a recolonization process now erasing those you know, ancient forms of identity and sexuality by now using terms such as trans, which have a completely different meaning within those indigenous contexts. So that's more of a question and something I've been thinking about, which is a very tricky and very touchy issue. Well, one of the difficulties, especially with that question, is that right-wing Christians in the U.S. are constantly going there to increase the homophobia. So part of what's happening is they're trying to make it into a proxy war, where you use Uganda in order to get back at queer folks in the U.S. I mean, that is very clearly one of the things that's going on. There are several very well-organized ministries that are devoted to spreading as much homophobia as possible into other parts of the world. So we are already implicated in a situation of really sort of dire messing already. So it's difficult to know what to do. It's absolutely true. Should you go in and try to help the people who are about to be persecuted, knowing that you're also going to be bringing in your particular ideas. Do they want them or not? What if they suddenly want them? It's a really tough question. It's true. And that's why I think the question of communities is so crucial. Just to add one little factoid that Vanessa's uh, discussion was reminding me of, the term coming out did not originally mean telling straight people who you were. It meant actually finding other gay people. The, the analogy was you're a debutante, you're coming out in society, into your gay and lesbian world. And so it was, had nothing to do with the outside world. It was about the community itself. And we often, in our like, desire to sort of find public space and to assert 
our, our sort of our existence, we often forget that the community itself has to sort of be nurtured in that way. So it's really complicated. I'd love to know with people in Uganda, for instance, or in Kenya, what do the people there who are on the ground, who are on site, who are in the most danger, what do they want to use? Is there a way you can ask them that doesn't endanger them after all? Um, because it's sometimes so, I mean, you know, what if you were in Chechnya? Um, it would possibly be a terrible thing even to look for queer people because to expose them is to kill them automatically. And I don't really know what to do with that, but it's something that, that your questions remind me. It's true. So we do have one last moderated question, but I do want to give a moment if any of the other panelists want to respond to O'Hini's question, because I think it was a fantastic one. Anybody else would like to add anything else before we move on to the last of our questions? No, but I love the idea of coming. I'm going to have a quinceanera in a couple of weeks. I'm a delayed uh, coming out. Get a good dress. All right, so we have one more question that we have prepared for the, for the panelists, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So the last question that we have, um, and a few of you have mentioned sort of research and demo, pulling demographic data and things like that. So speaking a little bit to that point, um, but how do we capture changing labels and names and representation when we are researching sexual and gender identities and we know that this language is fluid and changing and that there's so many different um, words that people use to describe their experience. So how do we capture this fluid and changing language um, for research purposes or other purposes? Uh, I'm a quantitative scholar, so I deal with this all the time. Um, you know, I think part of it, this is partly why I kind of harp on the whole, like I really think it's important that we separate out oppressions and identity and also link them together, uh, but separate out in the sense of, you know, understand, like that we are, understand that when we're speaking of the labels themselves, how individuals experience the oppressive forces that may or may not be associated with those labels depend on the context that they're embedded in. It depends on various things. And so I think calling attention to that is really important. So, you know, I don't have an easy answer to that question. I think obviously we're at a time that lots of different labels have entered the lexicon um, in our culture. We, uh, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, as a quantitative scholar, you know, it, it, I, have had at times to group folks and, and write about sexual minorities, um, you know, in part because I don't have the power to be able to make any assertions about the small sample sizes I would have if I were to, and there are inherent issues with that practice. There are social and political implications, and I am cognizant of them, and I write about that in my limitation section or I write about it in the, you know, as I'm writing uh, in my papers. But, um, you know, so I think we, we all, we, you know, I, I'm part of the problem and I want to be part of the solution. Um, but, you know, I think there's a disconnect there a little bit in terms of how we are going to do quantitative work, which requires a certain number of folks, you know, it, it just is, you're, you're actually doing really a disservice if you're doing quantitative work that's not, you know, that doesn't have enough power because you could be making all kinds of crazy things, assertions, uh, you know. And so I, it's something I'm constantly navigating. And I, you know, I, and I, I, I'm welcoming the pieces that are coming out where we're getting a better sense from nationally representative data that have done open-ended questions of the various labels. Like I've asked to review a paper recently that got published um, on that, where they are looking at Ed Health, which is a large longitudinal um, nationally representative uh, uh, study that, that has happened for decades in the US where they have some data and some of the waves um, open-ended and they were analyzing the, the various labels and there are many. Uh, um, I guess I'll speak to a little bit what I said before of the idea if we're asking the open-ended question and we have like a box that says other and you know please specify um, how is that being used in the end? You know, are we lumping everyone together that marked other and then acknowledging that their experiences are gonna be very different? Um, are we calling everyone who marked other, you know, queer based on what they wrote in? Um, I guess thinking about like, what are the implications of doing that? Can you make any broad statements about the community or the project that you've worked on if you've done that? Um, being mindful of, I think we all have to be very mindful of how words evolve and how words change. Um, 
you know, like I was saying, sometimes on surveys, you see non-binary slash gender non-conforming. And then if someone checks that box and you want to say something about the non-binary community, you know, you've got two, potentially two or more different groups of people that are represented by that one line that somebody checked off. Um, so just being mindful of that, how things are changing and evolving. Um, and then, you know, again, realizing that there are limitations in how you are able to present data for everyone who did check that box. Um, well, I'm just going to go for the cop-out answer, which is what my CRS professors teach me, which is taking a bottom-up approach. Um, I think when we're doing any kind of research or advocacy, it should be centered. And especially those marginalized folks who are experiencing those violations or issues that we're dealing with. But then on the other hand, as someone who's not familiar with quantitative research and analysis from a very sort of lay person view, I think it also really depends on what we're collecting the information for. So I think there's a big difference in trying to track diversity of sexual minorities in terms of who's getting into, say, law schools, as opposed to interventions for mental health or sexual health in particular. So as much as I've, you know, beaten the bush around bisexual, pansexual, I also acknowledge why many people's sexual behavior is different from how they choose to label themselves. And I, I am aware that especially in HIV AIDS research in particular, they're quite fond of trying to askew the use of such terms, specifically because they're trying to track people's vulnerability as opposed to um, how they specifically identify. So I think it's, it's tricky, but um, I think first and foremost, it's important to have these interventions centered in, in a participatory approach that centers the lived experiences of actual folks who are experiencing these violations. Um, I will echo uh, Ohini's words by saying, uh, you know, the advocate in me when, when hearing this question wants to scream nothing about us without, uh, without us. Um, and so that for me, um, both in research, but I think even more broadly, you know, backed out um, talking about like academia, um, you know, and having more discussions like this, creating more space intentionally and centering communities that, that, that you know, we hope to represent um, with our various like privileges and powers and using that to intentionally center the voices uh, and experiences of those that, that we hope to capture in data or, you know, whether it be, um, you know, qualitatively just to get, you know, the, the uh, experiences of a particular group. Uh, it's always going to be important that we invite um, communities who have historically not been invited to the table um, and we include them at all levels of research, um, you know, what, from, from planning to implementation to, you know, dissemination and analysis, um, you know, we should really be including these communities and these various uh, representations to, you know, hold ourselves accountable too um, and make sure that we are doing good work. Um, because, you know, as someone who, who, who gets into this work to represent a community, that should be, you know, one of our guiding factors is are we doing good work? Um, and so for me, yeah, taking that bottom-up approach is really how, how I see us, you know, um, moving forward with that. Well, I must so do something different once again, because in the humanities and the arts, we don't do a lot of quantitative work most of the time. Um, mostly, I guess, I would kind of summarize it by saying that what we tend to worry about are various forms of close reading whether we're looking carefully at literature or we're examining music or we're looking at art or film or television or whatnot. What we are doing typically is we're looking at the nature of the representation. That is to say, we're looking at what the labels mean, how they're built and what their implications are. So it's less that we're figuring out how people actually are right now. We are figuring out things about historically how they might be presented. And I guess I would say that our biggest, uh, our most useful aspect in this case is we present you with the historical possibilities of what things have been done, 
more than anything else, so that you have a broader sense of what things have been done and could be done yet again in the future, um, which I think would actually be complementary to the study of how things are in this, in this other sense. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for sharing. What we're going to do now is actually open it up to the audience for Q&A, and I'll walk around with a microphone for folks. So does anybody have a question for our panelists? I see one in the back here. Thank you. Um, I'm not eh, quite sure how to ask the question, but kind of the thought that came up earlier when I think, uh, Madeen, you were saying about, you know, certain languages being policed and communities being policed and interrogated that way. So what do we, um, or what do I should say we and people of oppressed groups do when language and language practices, especially those that have been policed before or stereotyped negatively, when those languages and language practices then start being used or taken by, you know, larger, um, less oppressed cultures. So for instance, um, when you think about Spanish being used and when you think about AAVE being used, um, as well as some of the language within our own community, and then you start hearing people using it when they don't understand either the histories behind it, uh, the stakes that are tied in with it, or the oppressions that those groups that are using it um, experience. Just because um, I, I mean, I think, so that's one of the points I make. It's one of the sort of in that Latinx piece, which is, you know, that simply using the term um, is not really going to achieve its old, what the potential of it could achieve, right? And so I provide a definition that really highlights and talks about the social and political implications of organizations actually using that process of interrogating that term as a means through which they can question their heteronormative practices, right? And so I, I make that point very explicit in that, in that piece because I completely agree with you that simply, you know, just using Latinx for the sake of using Latinx is fine if that's how you identify, but, you know, the consequences of it will be fundamentally different if it's, if there's a process behind, right? If there's a, uh, a, 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 an interrogation of heteronormativity um, along with other isms that might matter to uh, Latinx identified folks. So I just wanted to note that that's something I'm thinking about, and I think it's important. Anyone else want to add anything? I guess I was thinking about um, as far as the policing goes and people, the question was more of like folks who are, I don't want to say appropriating language, but is that sort of where you were going? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know what we do. <laughs> I wish I wish I had an, an answer to how we solve that. Um, I think, I mean, it's a good, it's a good point to bring up though, that there are so many people using words that maybe culturally they don't have claims to. Um, and so that can be very difficult, especially when we are talking about how language is evolving. Well, you know, do certain words evolve? You know, are certain words reserved for certain people within the community? So I think being mindful of that as well, um, it's a very interesting point. Um, I was just muttering over here with Vanessa about something and it occurred to me this is really relevant. Um, part of the problem, you know, is that some of the things that enable us also really limit us. And one of the things that's really important is that the more that we make use of the mass media, for instance, and of the commodifications of our culture, the more we put some of these things at risk. Um, I don't have any problem with RuPaul's Drag Race. It's great for the visibility, but that also means that random straight people are going to be doing imitations of RuPaul's Drag Race. So it's something that you kind of have a problem with. You're going to gain and you're going to lose at that very moment. Now, for me, I can only speak personally with this. When I know someone who is, you know, going to take things inappropriately, that might be a time I would sort of say, um, you know, let's have a little talk here. 
But in a broader context, I don't know what to do. I don't really know how any sort of larger issues, how we can address those problems, but they're certainly real. But I think that the very act of trying to make ourselves more visible always courts that possibility that it will simply be appropriated. So it's a, it's a it's quandary. All right, thank you. Another question over here. Hi. Um, so for those of you who are first or second generation, how do you navigate identifying in, I guess, like as queer, bisexual, or anything in your native language? Um, how do you find the words? I mean, you know, I, I suppose I use queer or gay just as I, you know, gay I might, but um, but I have a complicated relationship with that term as well, because I think there was a socialization that happened for me, sort of self-imposed in some ways, um, around fitting in that label or that category that I sometimes wonder if it actually prevented me from different forms of expression I had expressed earlier as a, right? And so to, towards folks of various, right, different gender. And so um, I, I you know, I identify as gay. I would identify as gay anywhere. I always do. But there, I do have a complicated relationship. I sometimes think about how, you know, there was a point in which, you know, there was this sort of switch, uh, uh, you know, where I felt like, okay, I was in the US, I was at NYU, Stonewall was two blocks away. I was like, I got to be gay. You know, this is the moment to do it. And so, uh, you know, so I did it. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, I do feel like, you know, prior to that, I was engaging in intimacy with folks that weren't just men. And so I, that is something I, I like have a complicated relationship. I, I sometimes wonder just as the quandary that we noted uh, of, you know, these terms, um, you know, they, 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 they can allow liberation, they can also oppress us. I think cross-nationally, it's challenging to sometimes navigate certain constructs. Like Latinx has no meaning outside of the US. Nobody in Latin America is going like, I'm Latino, Latina, right? No, we use our nationalities primarily. It's just, it's a, it's a product of US racial ethnic histories. And so, you know, it's, it's, it, it's I hear you that it's a question uh, of how to navigate, you know, and I think that psychological borderland analogy really comes uh, to mind of, you know, I don't feel like I belong here and I don't feel like I belong there. I felt that way, uh, you know, as a freshman going to the Latino group and feeling like there was this compulsory sense of heterosexuality and then going to the queer group and feeling like I was exoticized or whatever or eroticized, whatever, you know, whatever thing. Brazilians, though, you might say, I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know. So, but I, I hear you. I think that's a, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a tension. Um, I guess adding to that, just having words for things in other languages, you know, where you just don't have the word for it. Um, I haven't spoken Dari in a very long time, but, um, the last time I guess I sort of became aware of like the word for gay, it's a slur and it's probably one of the worst things that you can say to somebody, um, in that language. So even finding a word and then it's interesting because I think we brought this up earlier, the idea of kind of the westernization of these words. And then when you go to try to explain something to your family who's not from here, you're using that terminology. And then you're sort of teaching them that because maybe there's not a word that fits. And then sort of where does language shift from there? So it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I think with me, it's a bit different because um, uh, my parents are from Ghana, but I grew up in South Africa. And so I'm not as fluent in my mother's home language um, as perhaps some of my colleagues may be in their mother tongue. So um, I've never actually really thought about what the equivalent of bisexual is in that language. But um, I do think one challenge is that in a lot of these indigenous languages, uh, for a lot of time, for a long time, there were words, but they're often 
derogatory terms for those things. And I think it's going to take a while before we find more empowering words or expressions. I do know in South Africa, there's a group that were recently trying to create a new set of words in the nine indigenous languages um, to describe things like queer, transgender, etc., and trying to find ways to indigenize these these modern terms to find expression um, within a local context. I can also speak to that as a first gen Indian American. My parents immigrated from India here. Um, to my knowledge, I speak Bengali. I don't even know if a word that would fit gay, bisexual, any kind of like sexual identity. Um, I know that when the behaviors are described, they're always talked about in a very negative connotation. Um, but to my knowledge, there's nothing about the identity itself, right? Um, if there is, it's an English word, right? Which kind of speaks to the, the colonialization, coming back to that point that Ohini brought up before, um, which also just made me think um, how subjective um, calling Western countries progressive is, right? Because you mentioned how colonialism did all of these horrible things, right? And imposed binaries and took away cultural implications from other countries and other cultures, right? And now that the Western world has kind of moved forward, as you might say, we think of these other countries that colonial, colonialism really, like really oppressed and really made suffer. We think of them as backwards now, right? And so it's unfortunate that even in my own mother tongue, which I should know so, so well and hold, I hold so dear to my heart, I can't even think of a term that I could identify with in my home language, right? And that's unfortunate. And that's a product of so many other things that we don't really talk about, right? And that goes back to the intersectionality of just different levels of oppression, so, yeah. Um, maybe this is one of those questions that we really want to think bottom up. Like, I'm, th I'm trying to think, you know, okay, so how would I say gender nonconforming Portuguese? And, and what I'm thinking immediately is, T talk to the folks I worked with, a nonprofit that, uh, that works with sexual minority communities in Rio. Like, ask those, you know, whenever I'm there and I talk to them, I learn. So I think we never want to assume that, you know, that these places don't have these terms that might, you know, be, whether it's behavior, language, or attraction. Um, you know, they, they, they probably have. And so, you know, some iteration of it. It, it may be informed by U.S. forces. It may not. But... But I think you know it's important to not make those assumptions as well. Like now that I'm thinking, I'm like, oh yeah, I would definitely turn to Marcos and ask them, like, you know, like what are you guys using in your work with gender nonconforming for? You know. Also, historical research suggests that unless you're part of some of these communities, you might never know what these terms are. I suddenly think of Harry Hay talking about how, well, in the 20s, we didn't have really a real term for it. What he meant was, of course, a positive term. We just said people were temperamental or that way. And that kind of rather evasive language might also be characteristic of, of communities who need to be sort of secluded in that way, in which case it makes it even harder to know how you're going to find out. My name is Kevin Kilgore. I'm the uh, lieutenant for the police department here at UCPD for the uh, Police Community Services Division. And so I'll give you a little context as to where I'm coming at from my question. Uh, as a gay man who grew up in the Bible Belt uh, in Southwest Ohio with very, very strict Baptist parents, with my dad being my high school Bible teacher, meeting my husband, moving to California, my husband is a graduate of UCLA Med School and Drew University's Med School. And he is the lead doctor for transgender medicine in the California prison systems over telemed. Very opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, and, and I'm sure I noticed a couple looks when I came in in a uniform of what are the police doing here? Well, this is why the police are here. I am the only gay identifying male in our police department. And I wanna make sure that we're doing the LGBT community plus right by what we do. So I teach our officers when they're having conversations with trans, transgender folks, non-binary folks, uh, and this array, and we talk about this, this continual uh, 
um, progression of language and the use of preferred pronouns and pronouns <coughs> and uh, how to form those into a report and how to make sure that we are showing respect to people that we're dealing with. So my, my first question of this is, I'm teaching people to just say to someone, how do you want to be preferred? How do you want me to address you? And I want to know, is that right? Am I doing that the right way? Or is there something else I could be doing better to teach our department and other officers throughout the, the state how to do that? And then also the question of how forgiving is the person that officers are addressing when they inadvertently make a mistake and don't address someone the way they asked to be addressed because of the implicit biases that cause them to see things in a different light than what someone wants to be seen. So I don't know if I said any of that right. I don't do well, uh, but that's my question. I'm willing to start. Why not? Um, the policy I always use is, yeah, I ask them or, you know, they will tell me if they want to. And then I work like hell to make sure I remember. And I try very hard not to fuck up. And I'm usually fairly good, but you always are going to slip. I hope they'll be understanding. You know, I'll understand actually if they're not pleased because, you know, God, if you have to deal with it all the time, you're going to, it's going to be a sore spot. Um, I don't know about the situation of your officers because, of course, because you're officers, it will always be a bit fraught. Um, you know, part of the problem, of course, is that most folks who are in these sort of sexually dissident positions don't necessarily have a good history with the cops. So that's always something, I guess, that your guys can keep in mind, that you're already dealing with people who are predisposed to be somewhat mistrustful. And... I don't know actually what to do about the sort of, yeah, you can have all the goodwill in the world, but people slip up. Um, it's tricky. I am a member of the Board of Trustees, and I still have a duty to the people that I serve. And I'm not probably best placed to speak about the specifics, but I can say one thing somewhat irresponsibly in general. I think it's important to remember that pronouns can be separated from the rest of the terminology because there's only a particular set of them. And I also believe that English like is evolving to a place rapidly where it's more like Chinese, where there is a third person. And I would just as soon see a single third person established as fast as possible because it's much simpler for people. At the same time, people sometimes want the other, the other varieties. So it's, it's really tricky to kind of balance. I am these days tending towards the default they because it seems, well, at least it covers everybody. But that may not be fair to people who want he or she. And that's where I am from somebody. I'm not as directly involved in it for my own person. So I'm kind of in your position in some ways, of like, let me see what I can do to make this right. Because this is not where my, this is not where I have been harmed in this particular respect. Do you all have? Um, what I, I mean, what I will say, I mean, yes, um, mistakes happen. Um, I think that, I think that's a 
given. Um, and, you know, some, some people are more, are more mindful of the fact that they make mistakes. And we also know, you know, like you yourself had said, that, that not everyone from these communities have necessarily had a great working relation or a great relationship um, with officers. And, you know, I have seen from my own experience that there, there are some people who maybe aren't so apologetic in the way that they interact with trans folks. So I can get that that is an area that needs to be worked through. Um, what I will say about, um, you know, the training uh, and working with, you know, the officers on like best practices on and interacting with, with trans and non-binary folks um, will echo, echo the, the, you know, gender neutral language. I think that a lot of us use it a lot more than we realize and it's something, you know, we could easily continue doing and there are going to be people who prefer um, to have a pronoun and, and, and continuing to ask that is, is always going to be important. Um, but I think, I think that it, it's more than just asking a pronoun. Um, you know, there, there are certain histories that I think need to be taught. There are certain contexts that need to be put into place for officers who are going to be working with trans and non-binary folks. Um, I don't think that that is a one-time training uh, as well, um, which, you know, has been my experience, um, you know, doing work with like a correctional uh, department in San Francisco. Oftentimes it's a like one-time training. You get your name signed on a piece of paper that says you had it, never have it again. Um, and so to just challenge that, I think that it's, it's an intentional move to constantly have those trainings, um, you know, and intentionally have them consistently coming up and bring, you know, as, as I've said throughout out this thing, centering the voices of the community. So bring trans folks in to develop those trainings, bring trans folks in to lead those trainings and invite them back. Um, and as you yourself notice that, you know, whatever challenges that you're facing in, in, in working with or communicating with trans and non-binary folks, bring them in um, and have that conversation with them. Because, you know, I, I would love to say that I could give you an answer that will work um, from now until the end of time. But the reality is we just had a conversation about how everything changes. And so language and, and, and the way that we work with different communities is constantly going to change. And so having them be a part of those conversations as you decide what it is that you need to be, you know, trained up on is, is gonna be a lot of helpful. Thinking about the intersecting of intersecting identities may be important. And, and the reason I mention it very quickly, because I also agree I'm not may not be in the best position to comment on the question, but um, I had a reaction to seeing you um, in uniform when I came in. And interestingly, the reaction is really coming from doing years of work in Maricopa County, where Sheriff Arpaio, I was a faculty, I was assistant professor at ASU for six years, and I've been studying immigration enforcement for many years and its impact on Latino community, Latino youth, Latinx youth, or, and uh, however folks identify. Um, and I, that, that was really the source of my reaction. Uh, the source of my reaction is that when I see folks in uniform, I think of kids being torn apart. I think of families being torn apart. Um, I think of my peers being arrested. Um, and so I, you know, I just wanted to highlight that. And I'm really glad you're here, and I'm really glad you spoke. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I guess my reaction, so reflecting on my reaction made me think of the importance of not only having these trainings that are LGBT specific or, you know, racial, ethnic minority specific, but also introducing this language or thinking about the intersecting positions that folks might occupy and how they might respond to police officers and folks. Um, I just want to add something very briefly. When we're asking questions about pronouns, I think it's important to ask everyone because there's this idea of clocking people. Um, so, and that might also upset someone. So like you're trying to ask the question and then someone feels like they've been clocked in some way. Um, so I would just be mindful of that. Um, yeah, I don't, I think that what you're trying to do is, is extremely important because that's, I mean, this is the first time I've heard an officer say that I'm trying to, you know, get this done. I'm trying to get people educated so that other people feel safer. Um, so I do appreciate that you're doing that. Um, 
And again, I'm glad you're here and that you asked the question. Well, I just wanted to say that I also appreciate that uh, um, that you're here and that you're doing that kind of work. I just, I do, I, it's just really happy to know that um, you're using your position to influence others around you. I think that's commendable. So we have time for one more question, and Aaron's actually passing out an assessment form, so feel free to fill that out as well before we close. But we do have time for one more question. Oh, pens are coming around as well. There's a question over here. Okay. Who has a question over here? All right. Thank you. Hi. Um, one of the things that really struck me uh, when you were talking was about uh, discontinuity and blockage when you're talking about the like LGBT history as a collective discontinuity and collective uh, blockage. And this got me thinking about like queer time and of how like our own like personal identities and our own timelines are in tension, in tension with um, like cis heteronormative timelines. And I was wondering if you guys could like speak to your own experiences with time. I think that, you know, if I, it resonates, your, your point resonates with me a lot. You know, I think about how my 20s probably was like what the teen years were like for cis hetero folks, you know? And so I, I mean, it really resonates with me because I do think this sort of idea or notion of how we experience queer time, I actually had not heard that term, but, uh, but I, it is important, I think, in how we think about uh, labels, uh, in, you know, sort of individuals' experiences, whether re reflected or not. Um, but also the other thing that's somewhat, uh, I think it's related, I immediately went there, but I, I kept thinking about how our relationship to sort of cis hetero communities, not only in terms of time, but I also kept thinking, I really struggle with HRC, and I really struggle with the obsession over gay marriage as a queer Latinx identified person. To me, there are various other issues that are, you know, much more pressing. Uh, police violence, uh, immigration, you know, hostile immigration, uh, environment, you know, enforcement. Um, so, you know, I think we, we do a lot of things in relationship. I, and HRC to me did become a bit of a bastion of that, that energy of like, you know, fitting into heterosexuality. It's done wonderful things as well. It's, you know, like any org, it's complex. But I thought of it both in terms of my own timeline. I also thought about how we relate to cis, hetero, uh, you know, um, and whiteness uh, in a particular way within uh, the context of the dominant narrative within the community. Um, there are a couple of things, a couple of different directions I could go. Although I will say one thing about gay marriage is that lots of straight people hate it, so it can't be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess one thing I would think about is that certainly our position in marginal spaces means a lot of different things about how time progresses for us. Um, arguably from the point of view of many people who were straight who were in my generation, I've never grown up because I don't do those straight people things that usually count as markers for grown up -itude. You know, I didn't get married at the right time. I didn't buy the house at the right time. I didn't do all these things that are actually considered to mark a respectable life. And that actually gets to the place I'd rather be because part of what's really at stake isn't just even temporality. It's the, po the possibility of being respectable. You know, now I'm perfectly willing to give up that, but I can because being an academic, you don't really have to, and you're not respectable anyway, let's face it. Um, but I wonder what that means for people who are in more difficult positions, who have to at least create a facade of respectability. Um, you might wonder about certain political figures who are perhaps never married and from South Carolina, who seem very peculiarly located with respect to sexuality, but it's obvious that it was some sort of bargain to achieve this respectability. And it does have weird temporal effects too.
All right, well, I thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much to our panelists, to our moderator. Also to Bruin X and the Williams Institute for sponsoring this program with the LGBT Campus Resource Center. Please fill out, fill out your assessments and you can leave them in the back of the table. Thank you all so much. Feel free to have some more food and thank you for being with us this evening. Exactly what happened to my friend. Because that's what exactly like, oh my god, last weekend we had 